going to start at five minutes after 10 today. Given that it's a Monday morning, we wanna give folks a chance to just trickle in. So thank you, we'll start soon. joining us today in Sacramento and via webcast. We will be starting the webcast in three minutes. Thank you for standing by.
morning. Thank you to those of you who have joined us here in Sacramento at the Cal EPA um, Byron Schur Auditorium. And thanks to those who have joined us throughout the state via webcast. We're here today um, uh, for the DWR proposed emergency regulation for groundwater basin boundary revisions public meeting. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tanya Carlone. I am a facilitator with the Center for Collaborative Policy. I'm here today with my colleague, Stephanie Horry, who will be taking meeting notes. Regarding the um, details of today's meeting, to, is, this is the first meeting. We will have two other meetings around the state. The next will occur on the second in Bakersfield. And the final meeting will be um, on the third in Santa Ana. All public comments on this um, basin boundary revision should be received by the department on September 4th. And you can see the on your screen there the email address at the bottom of the screen. Looking at the agenda today, oh, we will, following these introductions, we will move into some background information on the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and we'll go into a more complete presentation about the basin boundary regulations. Those presentations will be given by Trevor Joseph, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Section Chief, and Stephen Springhorn, the senior engineering geologist with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Section. Following that presentation, we will um, spend over an hour, if necessary, taking public comment, which will follow a period of questions for clarification. And we just want to make a distinction between those two ways of receiving your input. Since this is official public meeting, there will be a a public comment period, but immediately following um, Trevor and Stephen's presentations, we will have questions for clarification. If there's anything that, uh, any information that has been provided that you would like to ask questions about. We're convened here today on August 31st at 10 a.m. to receive public comments on a proposed rulemaking action by the Department of Water Resources. Today's public meeting is scheduled to conclude at 12 noon. The department has proposed changes to the California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Division 2, Chapter 1.5, commencing with Section 340, where we refer to this regulation as the Basin Boundary Regulation. Please do make sure to sign in if you're here in Sacramento to sign in on the attendance sheet. That sheet is for everyone, both speakers and non-speakers. And as I've said, we are via webcast today, so for your information, the department will be audio recording this public meeting. I'd like to call your attention to the exhibits. Um, and the supporting information that you received. The draft Basin Boundary Emergency Regulation, um, first the, the text of the draft Basin Boundary Emergency Regulation. Just so you know, this is the, regu this is the draft that was produced on July 17th. The, de the department has not made any changes to that draft in the interim. Additional supporting information is the draft Basin Boundary Emergency Regulation Technical Fact Sheet. And there's also a fact sheet on how to comment, and I'll go into the specifics of how to comment in a moment. There's also other supporting information, including brochures, and you'll notice that you, um, there are comment cards outside, so please feel free to provide written comments and, and hand them to Lauren on your way out of, of the auditorium. I just want to make note, as you can see there at the bottom of your screen, that the draft -like regulations were posted, as I stated, on the 17th on DWR's website, and that occurred at least 30 days prior to this public meeting. You can find those uh, the regulation, that draft regulation, as well as further information about uh, the groundwater management program at that email address on your screen. As I referred to um, in pointing to the exhibit, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time talking about how to provide your oral comments. They will be made in the order 
that they were submitted. Um, for those of you who are here in uh, Sacramento, there are cue cards uh, that were outside. If you did not receive one of those, when we get to the comment period, just raise your hand and Mark, if you could raise your hand, Mark Norberg with the department will come around and provide you with a cue card. Then we will collect those and all comments. Uh, we will call you forward and those comments will um, uh, be listened to in the order that they were received. The department will accept public comment only and will not respond to any comments and testimonies during the public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers will please state their name and affiliation, if any. And I'll just point out to those of you who are present here, we would ask for you to come to the stationary mic um, that's here in the, in the front of the room when making your comments. If possible, speakers will please provide the page or section numbers of the regulation to which your comments refer. Oral comments should be addressed to the department, should be relevant to the proposed regulation, and please do have them be professional and kind. They should not be of a personal nature. The department staff may impose a time limit. Um, however, because we do not have a full house today, um, we will not be instituting a time limit, limit. Just for your information in future locations, if we do receive many people um, if, uh, who come to the meeting, we will institute a three minute um, time limit. So with that, I would encourage um, Trevor to come and give you some background information. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Tanya. So as mentioned, I'm uh, Trevor Joseph. I work for the California Department of Water Resources. I am um, one of the program implementation leads for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Program. Today, I'll be focusing on just providing a brief background of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, next slide. Then I'll turn it over to Stephen Springhorn, who's the project manager for the Emergency Basin Boundary Regulations to go through the, the uh, providing a, a description of the draft regulations summarizing the uh, draft regs and then uh, describing next steps. So with that, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, as many of you know, was passed um, almost a year ago today in September of 2014. The act became effective January 1st, 2015. The legislative intent of the act is a recognition that groundwater is best managed locally or regionally, but must be managed sustainably. The act provides local agencies with necessary tools and authorities to manage groundwater. Um, the act, another legislative intent was to establish minimum standards for sustainable groundwater management. And then there's a description of how the state uh, shall intervene, but only when necessary. So in terms of roles and responsibilities, the, uh, the Act provides a framework for establishing um, regulations and provides definitions for sustainable groundwater management. There's a local agency role that local agencies are responsible to establish groundwater sustainability agencies to cover high and medium priority basins, which I'll describe in a subsequent slide. Provides locals the, some powers and authority. Locals now need to prepare groundwater sustainability plans, again, for high and medium priority basins. And there's a series of deadlines uh, for, for locals uh, to adhere to some of these requirements. The state's role is we're developing basin boundaries and um, priority, excuse me, basin boundary emergency regulations, the reason we're here today. Um, we are have reprioritized, actually using prior prioritization, um, basin boundaries. We provide technical assistance. The Department of Water Resources will be doing state evaluation and assessments of groundwater sustainability plans. And then the State Water Resources Control Board uh, will potentially be intervening if local agencies cannot meet some of the legislative deadlines. So as I mentioned briefly, there are, um, this act in, is, is specifically um, uh, required for high and medium priority basins. The map to the right um, illustrates those high and medium priority basins. There are more, there are 515 groundwater basins and sub-basins throughout the state. 127 of, of those basins, 127 have been deemed uh, high and medium priority through the department's uh, basin prioritization process. 
Those 127 high and medium priority basins are illustrated on the right in that graphic with uh, orange and um, yellow um, designations. The 127 high and medium priority basins cover um, 96 percent of the average annual groundwater supply and 88 percent of the population overlying those uh, all, all basins based on 2010 uh, data. So as it relates to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, the act applies specifically to those 127 high and medium priority basins as they're required to prepare groundwater sustainability plans in the future. So I know you can't really see this graphic, um, but we always point out the this illustration as a good roadmap for all of the major milestones of the act. The uh, Today we're here focused on basin boundary regulations, which occurs relatively early on this timeline. This timeline is in the strategic plan. There's copies of it outside that's also available on our website. It's a great kind of single resource to understand all the major milestones in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And then finally, I just want to point to the Department of Water Resources Strategic Groundwater, excuse me, Sustainable Groundwater Management Strategic Plan. Um, here, this document, which again is, is, as mentioned, outside, available on our website, provides the department's goals, objectives, and actions for implementing the act. So if you're interested in uh, items unrelated to basin boundary regulations today, this is a great resource to look at how the department plans to implement uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen and he'll take us through the process. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you everyone for attending today. My name is Stephen Springhorn. I'm the project manager for these emergency regulations. So I'd like to cover, as Trevor mentioned, three topics. The first would be a process, overall process and timeline for these regulations. Then the second topic will be a brief overview of the regulations. And then finally, I'll wrap up with next steps and where we're heading with these regulations. So we've used a phased approach to guide us on this in these regulations. We started in the first two phases with scoping and, and understanding the issues and challenges that uh, stakeholders and the public have on the existing basin boundaries as they're currently defined. We used all this valuable feedback develop, as we developed the draft framework and draft regulations that you see before you. So during this phase now in the draft emergency regulations, this meeting and the other two this week will be where we're taking comments on these draft regulations and we'll use all of this information as we uh, refine the regulations for that last step of adopting them, which requires California Water Commission approval. What this process looks like on a timeline here is the orange boxes represent where we've engaged the California Water Commission. That's required because as I mentioned, the California Water Commission has to approve these regulations. So we're in the, the point where the, we're having our public meetings as required in the SIGMA, in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Our next engagement of the California Water Commission will be September 16th, where we will summarize the comments we've received today and the other two public meetings this week, and any refinements we plan to make on the regulations um, at that commission meeting. We'll then present the entire package of the emergency draft regulation to the California Water Commission in October for their consideration and adoption. Once adopted, we will submit the regulation to the Office of Administrative Law that will finalize the regulation. Our goal is to open up the revision request windows window for local agencies to submit their revision request to us by January 1st, 2016, and that window will be open for three months after that date. And a key point here is this is just the first of many opportunities for these boundary revisions to come in. This first window will be 90 days, and then in the future, they'll be linked to future updates of Bulletin 118. So how to provide input. You're here today. Uh, that's one opportunity to provide input. The other opportunity is uh, attending the California Water Commission meetings to provide input in that setting. And all of the comments we received are going to be, are, have been posted on the, our website and will be posted there. And we've received four official comments to date and we'll be posting all the others there soon. 
So now an, an overview of the draft regulation itself. So I'd like to start with an overview just so we all have a common understanding of what the draft regulation is and what is required in it. And it all starts with the requirements of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act for this process. And that is to establish these emergency regulations for local agency initiated revision changes to existing basin boundaries. Those regulations need to be adopted by January 1st, 2016. And in SIGMA, there are four key components of technical information that's required to justify a revision modification or re revision or modification. And they all center around the sustainable management of the proposed basin. So the first is information demonstrating the proposed basin can be sustainably managed. Then technical information on the boundaries and conditions of the proposed basin. And then consultation with interested local agencies and public water systems in the affected basins and then any other information DWR deems necessary. So what these regulations do is they add sp specifics to each one of these four components and they also establish the methodology and the criteria of how we're going to assess those four components. And there's three major criteria that we'll, we'll be using to evaluate these revision requests. The first is the likelihood the proposed basin can be sustainably managed, whether the proposed basin would limit the sustainable management in adjacent basins, and then whether there's a history of sustainable groundwater management of groundwater levels in the proposed basin. So some key points on the regulation, our intent for these regulations is for statewide sustainable groundwater management. So that is the lens we'll be looking through for all of the revision requests that come into us. We also want this to be an open and transparent process. So we, don't want, we do not want any surprises at the local level of basin revisions or modifications coming in that are, are surprising locals. So we have many areas of the regulation that will require um, an open and transparent process. Technical points, the state has a complex statewide hydrogeology and the basin boundaries were last updated in 2003. So there are a lot of new reports and maps available that might be used to update these boundaries. And the previous boundaries were used for voluntary planning. And so now with the enactment of SIGMA, the all high and medium basins uh, are required to manage their groundwater sustainably. So that has elevated the importance of these basins and their boundaries. So all of that has led to varying levels of detail in the existing Bulletin 118 data set and has resulted in a high variability of potential modifications that the department can receive. So we've tried to make an, a regulation that's flexible and able to capture all of that, um, all of that variability coming in statewide. And finally, administrative points. Only local agencies can request modifications. So any entity that is not a local agency, we encourage them to work with their local agency to, to submit a revision request. And then finally, local agency requests are voluntary. So this is an opt-in process. This is not required to make revisions. This is only if local agency feels a revision needs to be made. A few fundamental definitions that really relate to this whole regulation is the groundwater basin and groundwater subbasin. The basin is the whole three-dimensional structure of aquifer system. It's bounded uh, between aquifer and non-aquifer, and that boundary there, the external boundary, is has always been defined using scientific information. And we've carried that through uh, these regulations. However, subbasins are a, a smaller subset of a, a groundwater basin defined on geologic or hydrologic conditions or political or jurisdictional boundaries. So the subbasin lines have been defined using a balance of scientific and jurisdictional revisions in previous Bulletin 118's boundary revision process, and we plan to carry that through these regulations as well. So a summary of the regulation articles, it's the regulation is broken up into seven articles. The first two are introductory provisions, the intent, and then definitions, so key terms used in the regulation. The third article is, is all about the different types of modifications. The fourth article are the procedures to, for local agencies to submit revision requests to the department, and then a 
explain a protest provision that we'll get into more detail in, in subsequent slides. The fifth article is all about the supporting information needed to justify a basin modification. And this is really where the majority of the regulation is and all of the details on what is, is needed to justify a provision. Then matching each one of those requirements is in Article 6 is the, met, is the criteria of how we'll assess the information that's submitted to the department. And finally, Article 7 is just how the department will finalize these basin revision requests that come into us from local agencies. The next several slides is a, a series of, of figures that walks us through the, the overall process of this, this regulation. As I mentioned, it all starts with the existing Bulletin 118 basins. And that will be January 1st, 2016. And it, there's a decision point at the local level if a boundary needs to be changed or not. And so if the boundary is not changed, the existing basins and sub-basins will be carried through to the next version of Bulletin 118, which will be the interim update in 2017. If a boundary revision is requested, it will fall into two main categories, scientific changes and jurisdictional changes. And that's Article 3 and 4. And just a, a brief summary of those types of changes. Scientific changes are ones based on geologic or hydrologic conditions that define the basin. Jurisdictional changes are those that promote the adoption and implementation of effective sustainable management plans, and that will enhance local management of groundwater. So jurisdictional changes can have scientific information in them and jurisdictional, so it's a balance between, between that type of information. So just a few graphics on the different types. This is an example of a scientific type of modification where you're modifying the external boundary of a basin or subbasin, or the new boundary where there might have been identification of a fault or barrier to groundwater flow. Those are all classified as scientific modifications. There's three types of jurisdictional modifications. The first is internal. So these are internal boundaries between basins or subbasins where the lines are being moved to promote sustainable management. Then the next category of jurisdictional changes are consolidation. This is going from many to one or many to fewer basins with the idea of increasing the management size of your groundwater sustainability agencies or groundwater sustainability plans. And there's a special category of consolidation where all of the contiguous aquifer system, aquifer area or basin area in a county can be consolidated into one basin or sub-basin. And finally, the, the last type of boundary modification is subdivision. That's where you're going from one to many basins or there's, you're subdividing an existing basin or sub-basin into multiple pieces. The next part of the, the process is really the, the required information to justify a revision. And there's three main components. The first is information on the local agency requesting the change, or as it's defined in the regulation, the requesting agency. And just a, a note, the blue arrows here represent opportunities for stakeholders to be involved in this process. So the first two opportunities are here in this, this component where a request, the agency information, the requesting agency information needs to be provided and a board resolution from that agency has to initiate the boundary revision request. That provides a, a, at least one public meeting at the local level on each boundary revision. The next opportunity is notification and consultation. There's a series of requirements in this, these regulations for notifying and, con and consulting interested local agencies and public water systems. The next component is local support. There's, this is a tiered approach to local support with the severity of the modification. So for jurisdictional changes, for the internal modifications, the affected local agencies or public water systems need to support the change. For basin consolidation, a majority of the affected local agencies need to support the change. And then for basin subdivision, all of the local agencies and public water systems in the affected basin need to be uh, support the change. So at any point, if a local agency or requesting agency doesn't have these requirements, 
there's always a fallback position of the, using the existing basins or subbasins as they're currently defined. The third and final component of the required information is technical information. And all of the revision requests were requiring a description of the basin boundaries, the new basin boundaries. So that's the map, the GIS files, all the information the department will need to make an update to the basin boundaries. For all of the jurisdictional changes, we were asking for evidence of existing water management in the basin. So that's existing groundwater management plans, integrated regional water management plans, adjudications, or technical studies. So with all of these technical components, it's more of an, an exercise of gathering existing information. And that's a key point. For basin consolidation and subdivision and scientific changes, we're asking for a hydrogeologic conceptual model. This is, this is not a requirement for a three-dimensional flow model of, of the basin. That can come in to justify, but it, this is more of an understanding of the aquifer system in a narrative form. This, is, this can be found in existing groundwater management plans. This can be found in existing Bulletin 118 basin descriptions. So it's that level of information we're looking for. Then with subdivision, we're, we're requiring historic and current conditions of the basin. So the idea here is we want local agencies to understand the current and historical conditions of the basin they are trying to subdivide to make sure that that requesting agency is not fragmenting off potential problem areas of overdraft or land subsidence or water quality issues. So that's where we'll need to have uh, that type of information in our evaluation. And finally, for scientific, a technical study. This is the geologic maps or technical reports to justify that scientific change. And every revision request, there's an opportunity to protest. So any entity or person can protest a, a revision request. However, a formal protest requires the same technical information as a boundary revision request based on that type of revision. So we're gonna be evaluating those protests using the same criteria as we're evaluating all of the other uh, requests that come into us, or the same request that's protest, protested. So the department is going to evaluate all the information that comes in, and we are gonna come up with a, we're gonna develop a draft list of approved boundaries, and we'll post that in, on our website and hold at least one public meeting. Our goal is to have that accomplished by the summer of 2016. We'll use the information we get from that, those public meeting, that public meeting um, and comments and make any necessary refinements. Then we have, there's a new requirement for us to present each boundary change to the California Water Commission for them to hear and comment. So that'll be another opportunity to, for the public to engage in this process. And finally, after the, at the end of the process, we'll finalize those draft approved boundaries and what will make them official is publication in Bulletin 118. So we plan to have an interim finalization of those boundaries in the September timeframe. However, they will not be officially published in Bulletin 118 until first quarter 2017. That's our estimate um, right now. And that is subject to change on the number of revision requests that come in. Um, so we're trying to get these as finalized as quickly as possible because we realize it's, this is an important first step for local agencies to start to implement the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So next steps. As Tanya mentioned, September 4th, the public comment period will close. We will combine all those public comments we've received to date from today and the rest of this week and summarize that information for the California Water Commission and also summarize the, our planned refinements to these regulations. In October, the commission meeting, we plan to present the proposed emergency regulations for adoption by the commission. That will be followed by submission to the Office of Administrative Law with the goal of opening the revision request window January 1st, 2016, and then find, or getting a draft approved list of basin boundaries by September 2016 for the commission to hear and comment and for public um, comment as well. 
So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today. We look, we look forward to your feedback on these regulations. And these are just a, a few helpful resources or web links where there's a lot of additional information on these regulations for, uh, that we're, we're putting out there to help local agencies through this process. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So before we move to the the public comment period, we want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have, both related to the process that Stephen has outlined, or any clarifying questions related to the content of, of Stephen's presentation. And I would just like to mention to those joining us via webcast, you can see the email address at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions, again, related to process and any uh, presentation clarifying questions. Please withhold your, your comments until, um, un, until we get to the next slide. So I'd, I'd ask anyone in the audience here in Sacramento, do you have any questions based on that presentation? And I'll come around with a microphone. Okay, no questions in the room. And how about uh, via webcast, have we received any email questions? Okay, thank you, Stephen, for a very clear presentation. I'd just like to um, reinforce uh, how to make oral comments. And uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll just go through this process one more time. You'll see the email address there for those joining us on webcast to submit your comments. I'd like to make a note um, that, the, that we will not be reading those comments received via webcast to, out loud to the room, but they will be posted on the DWR website. So again, how to make comments. Oral comments will be made in the order of submitted cue cards. Just want to do a quick check here. Does everyone who wants um, a cue card have one? If you do not, please raise your hand and Mark is at the ready and he will come to you. Okay, thank you. The department will accept public comments only and will not respond to any comments and testimon t testimonies during the public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers will please state their name and affiliation, if any. Again, for those of you in the room, if you would please approach the microphone when your name is called to make your comments. If possible, speakers will please provide the page or section numbers of the regulation to which your comments refer. Oral comments should be addressed to the department, should be relevant to the proposed regulations. And the department staff may impose a time limit which we do not intend to do at this meeting. All right, so do we have cue cards, Mark? And then I can call folks up. I have one. David Boland. Okay, thanks. Sorry, David Boland with the Association of California Water Agencies. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments here. We appreciate the, the fact that the staff has worked hard to put these regulations together in short order, uh, that the timeframes in Sigma were aggressive, and, and we uh, recognize the fact there's been a lot of hard work put on by staff over a very short period of time. Uh, we particularly appreciate the process of sort of um, uh, vetting the um, concepts and then kind of working down to the idea of draft regulations. And we anticipate that that will be a successful approach in subsequent regulatory processes. So that's a kind of a important high level uh, process uh, comment. We, we uh, also appreciate the fact that you're teeing up some live opportunities to provide oral comments prior to the the deadline for the uh, written comments, and we also think that's a successful strategy. Uh, but by uh, it will be necessary, of course, uh, to identify the fact that you're going to get somewhat high-level comments here, and that's what I intend to do, and then more detailed comments in writing. And that's 
uh, probably uh, most uh, uh, successful strategy in terms of uh, you're providing or you're getting uh, good action uh, or good good uh, comments that you can provide action on. So uh, in general, we, uh, we have some changes that we're going to be offering up to the regulations. Uh, we do uh, believe that you've generally captured the scope as, as uh, required by Sigma um, and that you're properly providing some backstops on the process to try to make sure that there's some discipline about changing these boundaries. We don't want to see uh, arbitrary and capricious changes, obviously, that are counterproductive to the planning process that's coming up. However, we, we do think it's important to recognize that uh, some changes are going to be necessary and that there's a concept of deference to the uh, local agencies and their planning processes. And as these agencies are forming their GSAs, a part of the um, groundwater sustainability agencies, part of their decision-making process is you know, one of the first aspects is going to be their boundaries and what's uh, a practical and manageable approach to doing planning. And that, in fact, the boundaries that we inherited through this process were not uh, anticipated to be used in this way. And we all recognize the fact that uh, these, these boundaries for these basins have been uh, in place for a long time and evolved over a long period of time and are not necessarily uh, uh, either technically or, or jurisdictionally sound in, in all cases. So uh, we do anticipate after the regulations are adopted and hopefully with the changes that we're going to be recommending and others will be recommending to, to improve them, uh, that there will need to be some administrative discretion exercised by the staff, uh, and that not all cases uh, can a regulation be as explicit as it needs to be. And so even though we're, we're going to drive for, for, for uh, better regulations, we do anticipate the need uh, for the staff to exercise a lot of discretion in how they, um, they make judgments about some of the, the uh, material that will be submitted and some of the processes that they'll be coming into, um, uh, into very specific uh, kind of an evaluation, essentially, that they'll have to be doing about processes that are yet to be determined, that in some cases these, um, uh, these basin organizations are just now kind of figuring out how they're going to get this work done. And so there needs to be, um, again, a lot of discretion and deference uh, to local judgment. So uh, just kind of at the highest level, some of the overriding concerns that we have is that the, um, uh, the terms basin and sub-basin, uh, although... Uh, big efforts have been made to make sure that there's a consistent use throughout this uh, regulation. There are some places in which that needs to be improved, um, that there is, and I think the slides were helpful in showing a, 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 an illustrative approach to the, to the idea of basin and then sub-basins being tiered in, and yet that's an extremely important uh, concept in Sigma. And so uh, we're going to be offering up some opportunities throughout the, the regulation for clarifying how those terms are being used. And then also the fact that um, properly the regulation recognizes the fact that local agencies, as defined in Sigma, are responsible for making these determinations about basin boundary adjustments, and that individuals are not um, uh, don't have access essentially to this process. And yet, these local agencies represent elected boards and, and entities that are properly empowered to do groundwater management, and that those. Uh, those agencies can hear and should be hearing from diverse stakeholders within their areas. Uh, but we uh, caution again that the department not put its own judgment about uh, the, uh, I guess you call status of organizations uh, ahead of the, um, the reality of the local agencies on the ground and what their um, process is for uh, vetting um, stakeholder interest. Uh, we, we, in general, are a little concerned about some of the burdensome aspects that we believe are, are built into the regulations, uh, process requirements that may not be necessary. Uh, we know we're feeling our way into this uh, process, and we, and we recognize the fact that staff has, in sort of an abstract way, determined what might be problems and maybe built um, uh, processes to uh, uh, deal with problems that may or may not occur. And so we uh, encourage the department to consider removing some of the um, burdensome procedural aspects in the regulations, and we'll identify those. Two specific ones are the idea of the historical sustainable management uh, and the idea that the department needs evidence to make a determination whether there's a, a pattern of or capability on the part of the locals to do sustainable management. In fact, that is the point of SIGMA. We need to be forward-looking about the idea of doing sustainable management, and we're not there yet in many cases. And so, again, this is an example where deference 
will be called for. Uh, there does need to be a track record and some evidence of of, uh, of capabilities on the part of the locals to, to do the work. But um, we are uh, uneasy, I guess, about the possibility, particularly for um, for uh, fragmentation type or, or subdivision type uh, base and boundary adjustments, that those be uh, have a higher level of scrutiny, and we're a little concerned about that. They, they ought to have, we think, a, an equal level of scrutiny to all base and boundary adjustments. And then just on uh, the idea of unanimous support required, that is just, we believe, a, an unsurmountably high uh, standard uh, and unrealistic and, and not necessary uh, to, to ensure success. Um, unfortunately, California Water uh, and, and, and all of California governance is, is full of lots of differences of opinion about how things get done and lots of entities that have a difficult time cooperating. And there's some concern that this idea of unanimous support will be used as a leverage tool to essentially um, uh, thwart uh, the kinds of work that we need to be doing uh, on a broader context. And so we, again, believe that uh, the story ought to be evident that, that due diligence has been performed by the uh, entities as they're uh, asking for base and boundary adjustments, uh, that they have checked with all the various interests and including all the local uh, agencies that might be involved. But the veto of one local agency should not be uh, sufficient to torpedo the idea of a, a subdivision type um, base and boundary adjustment. So in conclusion, just the idea of deference and the idea of empowerment and uh, the idea that local agencies need to be empowered for success, that these regulations do provide some bright lines for testing um, adequacy. Um, there are some helpful concepts and we uh, support those, but we'll be asking for some changes to um, make sure that we don't overly burden this process out of the gates. And that would be the conclusion of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, David. Other, do we get other cue cards? Anyone, would anyone else in the room like to uh, make a comment? And we will get you a cue card. Okay, thank you. And please know that um, you will be able to submit the written comments by September 4th. And let's go ahead and check in to see if we received comments um, via the webcast. Hong and Tim? Um, yes, uh, we received comment from Sacramento Groundwater Authority. Um, and we can read their overall uh, comments similar to Mr. Boland's comments, if that would uh, be satisfactory. How many comments have we received thus far? Uh, just the one. Why don't you go ahead and read it then? Okay. Thank you, Tim. So again, similar to Mr. Boland's comments, uh, we will only be reading uh, the overriding uh, considerations for the comments and the specific comments that have been provided by Sacramento Groundwater Authority will be posted on the website um, for all to review. Um, similarly, I will just uh, read, if I can, here the uh, comments from uh, John Woodling. Uh, the incongruent definitions of basin in the Su Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and Bulletin 118 create some confusion in draft regs. The terms basin and basin or subbasin are inconsistently used throughout the draft regs. The department should clarify throughout that throughout the provisions of the draft regs apply to all basins and subbasins in Bulletin 118, i.e., basins in Sigma. Um, the draft regs include important recognition of the role of local public agencies in implementing Sigma. This is reflected, for example, in Section 344.8, which acknowledges that local support will be based on the support of other local agencies rather than individuals or special interest groups. Similarly, Section 343.12 which requires that protests be held on the same standards as the original request properly protects the interests of local agencies in the process. In the same spirit of promoting the state's commitment to local groundwater management, we believe the draft regs need to more fully defer to local agencies' determinations 
that a revised basin boundary will lead to more effective and more timely sustainable management of groundwater. Only locals can adequately consider the technical, legal, political, and institutional issues that will be either opportunities or obstacles. The draft regs contain a number of provisions that may be unnecessarily burdensome to local agencies requesting a boundary modification. These include section 343.6, requiring all boundary revision requests affecting a basin to be combined, and section 344.8, requiring unanimous support as demonstrated by resolutions from the governing boards of all affected agencies and water systems. Similarly, the draft regs make the process more cumbersome by failing to recognize the differences that may exist between local agencies and public water systems in the affected areas. Local governments and water agencies are governed by boards of elected officials that are accountable to the public. Public water systems may be privately owned and serve as few as 15 connections. Clearly, the regulations must strive to support the interest of agencies that are accountable to the public and that serve the preponderance of the residents and industries in a basin. Uh, Mr. Woodling continues on with some very specific comments and recommendations that will be posted on the website. Thank you for that comment and thank you, Tim. Um, we have another comment, uh, Bob Gore. Hi, Robert Gore from the Gualco Group. Um, on behalf of Kings, Kern, Modesto, uh, Imperial, the Water Quality Agency, United Water, and uh, some others. We'd like to associate ourselves strongly with the comments of our learned colleague, David Bolin. Thank you very much, Bob. Anybody else would like to make comments today? Have we received anything else via email? Nothing further. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to comment, I'd uh, let you, um, I'm sorry, remind you about written comments. And you'll see here that they must be received by September 4th. The department encourages the submittal of a written copy of your oral testimony and any supporting evidence. So if you have that today, those two, two of you who made comments in the room, the department would appreciate that. And here is further information about how to, the various ways that you can submit your written comments, both via mail, you'll see the address there. You can also drop off your comments if you like, and email them or at, in person at these public meetings. As I mentioned, we have two more public meetings that will be occurring this week on the second in Bakersfield and the third in Santa Ana. So in concluding, we'd like to thank you for attending the public meeting on the groundwater basin boundary regulation. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day on a Monday morning to come in and be with us to hear it here today and via webcast. Finally, if you're not on the department's mailing list to receive future notices, please speak with a DWR staff member or leave your business card with us. Thank you very much and have a good week, everyone.